Hello, and welcome to part nine and our final part in this series on the origin of the Roman Catholic Church. We've been looking at a lot of different issues and how different things came into the Catholic Church. But one of the things we have to ask ourselves is regardless of exactly when the Roman Catholic Church started, how does this belief and teachings line up with the Word of God? <clears throat> there was a famous, famous and distinguished Roman Catholic physician who began to read the New Testament, began to read the Bible for himself. And after a short reading of it, after some studying of it, it says, quote, he tossed it from himself with impatience. And he stated, either this book is not true or we are not Christians. He saw immediately, he saw for himself that the system of Rome, the system of Roman Catholicism, and the system and the teachings of the New Testament were directly opposed to each other. Not in every single solitary teaching. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church believes in the deity of Jesus Christ and uh, in heaven and hell. And, and there are doctrines that are scriptural. But I would say the vast majority of them are not only not from Scripture, have nothing to do with Scripture, and are contradicted by Scripture, and have much more in common with pagan Roman beliefs. The papacy claims that its system of worship and the things that it teaches has been handed down through tradition. And they're correct. They're right. It has been handed down but not tradition from the Word of God, not tradition taught by Jesus and the apostles, <clears throat> but tradition that is based in the false pagan Roman Babylonian beliefs. That's the foundation that is there. So we go back and we look at a history of this, a recap of it. The Christian church in Rome in the first 300 years was what we would call the true Christian church. Uh, there was true Christianity there in its early stages, again, for about the first 300 years. Then there was a turning point. Uh, in those first 300 years, the, remember we said the Christians were being persecuted for their beliefs, not because they just believed in Jesus Christ, but because they wouldn't believe in all of the other gods of Rome. So they were persecuted. Now you get to around 314 AD, you have Emperor Constantine, uh, he has what is called a conversion, although I don't believe it was a true conversion to Christianity, but he has an experience and now he becomes very favorable to Christianity and he introduces the Edict of Milan. And with that, a lot of the persecution and everything was removed from uh, the Christian church and the Christian church becomes much more acceptable to the Roman people. It becomes more of the official religion and there are some uh, blessings and privileges is a better word that comes with being part of the Christian church. But remember then we emphasized uh, that Emperor Constantine had a double motive here. He wanted to unite the church and unite the political Rome. He wanted to bring them together under one umbrella. That is what he thought. He wanted to rule over all of them and have them united into one. So when you have this taking place, what you had taking place was now the Christian church. The pagans were beginning to come into the Christian church. We ended in our last lesson with that. That the, Christian, that the pagans were now going to become part of the Christian church because of what the emperor had done. But they didn't want to give up all of their pagan beliefs. So what they did, the church started doing under the leadership of Rome and the, and the emperor is that they started adapting the pagan beliefs into the Christian church so that it wasn't such a traumatic thing. It made Christianity more pal palatable to the pagans. And so they brought in the customs and the beliefs of paganism and just put Christian names to them. We ended again our last lesson with that and explaining that in more detail. On the surface, it looked like it might be a good thing that we have more and more people coming into the church, but in reality, it was not a good thing. It didn't make the pagans better. It made the church worse. And we gave the comparison with what's going on in the church today of adapting itself to the world. It's not making the world better. It's not making the world more Christ-like. It's bringing the church down. And God says it very clearly. Evil company corrupts good morals. If you keep company with evil, you're going to adjust to them. Because if they, if they don't adjust to you, they're going to wind up leaving. 
And that's what happens. When the world comes into the church, uh, they either adjust to the church or the church is going to adjust to them. One, one of the two. So, And it didn't happen. So it was a bad thing. It was a bad thing for Christianity. What we want to look now is, is again start to sum this thing up and start to pull all of it together. And so you have the Roman Catholic Church bringing in these pagan beliefs. And you can see more and more and more as time goes on that true Christianity is diminishing and the paganism is taking over and the false beliefs of paganism is taking over. This is where you start to see the formation of from the, the Christian church, the true Christian church, into the Roman Catholic Church because they're adopting or adapting, uh, integrating the pagan beliefs of Rome. And one has only to look at, uh, to move up to the time of the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, uh, the time of the Inquisition, and see what is going on there. I mean, we had all the other things that we talked about and looked at, uh, but when you look at this time, the cruel and murderous institution of the Inquisition, the things that were going on, the horrible and horrendous things that was being done by the Catholic Church, that was being initiated by the popes, and the leaders within the church, in the Roman Catholic Church, they were responsible for the bloodshed of over 50 million people. The persecution, the torture, and the bloodshed of over 50 million people. Listen to a former Roman Catholic priest, Bernard Frenzenborg. Frenzenborg. He wrote a book, 30 Years in Hell. This is a former Roman Catholic priest. 30 years in hell and he looks at the persecution that went on uh, during the inquisition and he puts it the number at over 70 million people that were killed you look at these things and you just say how can this be a church established by god and as we mentioned it before <clears throat> it isn't just a blip on the screen it isn't just you know we're going along a little boop this went on for a long 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 time hundreds of years under numerous popes. So it's not just a blip. And you look at this and you say, how can this be the church of Jesus Christ? How can these things go on? Again, I dealt with this in much more detail earlier. Uh, if you've not watched those, please go back and watch it. But this just shows you that it's not the hand of God that is establishing this church. It is the hand of man. And when you look at the Inquisition, I would even say it's the hand of Satan. These are demonic things that are going on here. So let's take this all and sum it up and recap it and put it all together in one final thought. What have we seen from the beginning here? One, we established and, and showed that Peter was not the first pope. We're going to go right back and say, let's look at the origin of the Roman Catholic Church. We said, number one, that Peter was not the first pope. We kind of grocery listed the points. I would again remind you if you want more detail to that, I've done a separate series on is Peter, was Peter the first pope? But we showed there that he was not. We showed that the Roman Catholic Church was not started by Jesus Christ. If Peter was not the first pope, it was not started by Jesus Christ or the apostles. Third, we showed that the scripture does not teach apostolic succession. It does not teach apostolic succession. So the things, these very two things, <coughs> excuse me, without Peter being the first pope, and without there being apostolic succession, that the very foundation of the church crumbles. In reality, everything could stop right there and say it's, there's, there's nothing else to build upon. Well, they did build upon, but it wasn't from God. It was from paganism. So let's look. So then we started to show that there is a difference between the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Again, remember, Catholic means universal. So we're talking about the first 300 years is when you're seeing the Catholic or the true Christian church, the true body of believers. As we get over to Constantine and we start seeing the merging together of the political and the spiritual and the adopting of, uh, of uh, pagan beliefs, now you're starting to see the birth of the Roman Catholic Church. And I emphasize it was called Roman for a good reason. So the birth of the Roman Catholic Church here. So we see then that the Roman Catholic Church became a mixture of Christian and pagan beliefs, pagan Babylonian beliefs. They adapted their names and their identities. The vast majority of the Roman Catholic teachings can be traced to pagan origins. I gave just a few here in our lessons. The Mass, 
I'm not going to break them down, go back and listen, but we saw that the Mass had pagan origins, the role and authority of the popes and the cardinals and the bishops, the exaltation of Mary, the different names and titles and attributes and powers and position that have been given to Mary down through the ages have nothing to do with scripture, but correspond back to beliefs in different pagan goddesses and how they brought them together and just simply changed the name like from Itis, Isis, I mean, or Miletus or whatever, and moved it over to Mary. Uh, the veneration of images. Uh, not worshiping images, but bowing down before the images and having the images to, to, you know, the Catholic Church will teach, well, this helps you to remember God and to focus on him. Uh, seems to make no difference that the, that the scriptures say, don't do that. Don't do it. You're not to make any graven image. You're not to do these things. You're not to bow down before them. And again, the argument is, well, we're not worshiping them. We're venerating them. We looked at the definition of worship and showed that... Uh, Everything that goes on in veneration is actually worship. We talked about how the Roman Catholic Church will define certain things and say, we don't worship Mary, we don't worship the saints, we don't do this. But when you go over and look at the actions, the actions are acts of worship. All you have to do is go and look up what worship means, the definition and the characteristics of worship. Salvation by works. How it's the grace of God and works are added to it. This has pagan origins to it. Every false religion has always got some kind of works involved in it. Not as a sign of salvation, but as something to procure your salvation. That's the difference that we're saying. That's the difference that we're talking about. Pagan origins. Penance. The doing of penance. Uh, the issuing of last rites. Uh, all have pagan origins. Purgatory itself pagan origins. It's not come from the scriptures. The scriptures teach nothing about it. Uh, the rosary, praying of the rosary, the vain repetition of prayers, praying to Mary, giving again the exalted position of Mary, making her a mediator, an intercessor, uh, the mother of all creation, all of these titles and things that go with it. Uh, not only it's not scriptural, <clears throat> It has its background in pagan beliefs and the mother goddesses that the pagans prayed to. And again, as I said, as it's not in scripture, it's contradicted by scripture. It's forbidden by scripture to be doing these things. The word of God says not to do it. Confession of sins to a priest. Um, the verbal confessions that have to be done and all of this. And if, if you don't do it, you don't say the right things and you're not complete in it. Well, then your sins aren't forgiven and you're still going to hell. This was taught in Babylonian beliefs that you had to go to the priests and confess your sins and it's your only way that you could escape hell. Then we talked about indulgences. Transubstantiation. We didn't touch too much on that, but all of this, uh, the indulgences of buying your way out of purgatory, uh, working your way out of purgatory, all has, per all has pagan beliefs. Getting yourself uh, pagan origins. I'm trying to speak too fast and stepping over my own words. Um, transubstantiation, we talked about the Mass and that, and that had, how that goes back to Mithraism and the, and, the, and the worship of Mithras, the literal eating of the flesh and the blood of a god, uh, that that's not there. Then we looked at next the uh, many of the pagan symbols that were adopted into Roman Catholicism, having really no justification in the church today, but showing the pagan origins that they did that they did have, and that they're still using them today. Again, the Dark Ages, the Inquisition, we talked about uh, really, I think, showing that these things are not from God. We also touched on lightly, we didn't talk about it too much, but that the scriptures were not given to us by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church did not give us the word of God. The, the scriptures were completed at least a couple hundred years, at least 200 years before the Roman Catholic Church even started, You're around 100 AD or so, that the writing of the scriptures were done and complete. And the Catholic Church is really not, Roman Catholic Church is not really coming onto the scene until after 300 AD. <clears throat> we then showed how Catholic traditions was invented to justify the unscriptural teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And we gave comparisons to other uh, religions of how, uh, false religions of how they brought in their own teachings. And then I kind of skipped over this and challenged you to do a study on this yourself, that the end time resurrection 
of the Babylonian religious system, which is portrayed in the book of Revelation, has tremendous comparisons to the Roman Catholic Church today. Uh, I was going to do a lesson on that and go through uh, a lot of the things that Revelation talked about, but I kind of said, well, it's not the origin of the church. It's going to come back in the end. It's, it's really a separate study in itself uh, that you should look into. But you look at all of these characteristics, all of these things that we brought up, and you know what? There's more. There's more. I mean, I'm, I'm scratching the surface here. I'm really scratching the surface. There's much, much more, and I, I, I can't challenge you enough to go in and study these things for yourself. I've kind of given you a skeleton here, and I would challenge you to go out and study. There's so much, much more that you put some meat and flesh on these bones uh, of what I've given you here. Now, I know that there's people that they're going to argue against these things and say, no, this is wrong and that's wrong and this and that. Uh, there's always been people that have done that. There always will be. I'm just putting the challenge out to you in individually. I encourage each and every single one of you to study these things for yourself, to go in and look at history, to go in and look at the Word of God. You saw the example I gave you of that physician <clears throat> when he started to read the scriptures and said, we got a problem here. Either these scriptures are wrong or what I've been believing as a Roman Catholic is wrong. Something's wrong here because the two don't go together. That's what happened to me in my life. Uh, I was a Roman Catholic. Now, it wasn't simply reading the scriptures that got me out of Catholicism. I came out of Catholicism before that. But as I came out, when I came out of Catholicism and I did receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, <clears throat> not a simultaneous act, but after I received Christ as my Savior, the Lord gave me a thirst for the Word of God. And then I started reading the Scriptures. And as I read the Scriptures, I saw that there was such a contradiction between what the Word of God was saying and what I was being taught in the Roman Catholic Church. And so what I did is I went out and I started to talk to, to leadership in the church. I started talking to different priests. I literally went around and knocked on the door of the rectory and said, excuse me, got a minute? Can you talk to me? Uh, I've got some questions here. And it wasn't questions. I think some people misinterpreted this <clears throat> from my uh, original um, video and when I said why I'm no longer Roman Catholic, that I kind of got confused and I went to the to the priests and the bishops and they couldn't give me an answer. So therefore I left the Catholic Church. No, I was already out of the Catholic Church, but I was going back and giving them a chance to say, hey, here's what the Bible says and here's what you're teaching. And I eventually ended up go talking to a bishop and his statement to me was, after I asked these questions of him, is he says, Fred, I can't really answer you from the Bible, but I can tell you what the church teaches. And there it is. There's the crux of it. They know what the church teaches. They know the traditions of the church. They know the beliefs of the church, but they can't line them all up with what the Bible says. That's what this, this doctor saw. And he says, it's one or the other. They can't be the same. I encourage you, read and study the word of God. Now, I'm not saying to you, don't go to the priests and don't talk to, to people in the church. But if you go there, understand the well that you're coming from. Understand the well that you're drawing from. They are locked into this system. Now, you can understand and get their perspective. Uh, every, you you want to always have a complete picture. But you need to go to the Word of God. Don't assume. Don't assume. I, if I can just challenge you with that, do not assume. Don't blindly accept what you believe. I've always said don't blindly accept what I'm saying. Research these things. Study these things. See if they're true. Search the Scriptures. Don't blindly believe what I'm saying. And also don't blindly believe what the Roman Catholic Church is teaching. Because I'm telling you, it's coming from man. And if it contradicts the word of God, it is not true. Don't blindly just set back. Don't set with this thing as I've, I was born a Catholic, I'm going to die a Catholic. That's what I used to say in my life. I said it numerous times. I was born a Catholic, and I'm going to die a Catholic. And if you started to say something to me about the Catholic Church, boom, boom. I was ready to start rocking and rolling with you. The battle was on. Why? Because I knew what I was talking about? No. You were just, you were attacking my church. 
So what did I do? I blindly defended. And there's a lot of Catholics do that today. There's some that study more. But most Catholics are just blindly defended because it's their mother church. It's what they're a part of. They've invested all of their salvation in the church. Maybe all of the family was in there. I'm telling you, don't be deceived. Look at these things for yourself. When you stand before God, he's not going to ask you, what did your family believe? What did your mother believe? What did your grandmother believe? What did this one believe? What did that one believe? What, were you tell what did you believe? And why did you believe it? You're going to have to answer for you, for no one else. And you're not going to be able to say, well, the priest told me this, and the Pope told me that, and this one told me that. What does my word say? You've got to get into that. Do not blindly follow anything. Do not blindly follow any man. And if you don't do these things, if, if, if you don't search these things, I mean, we're talking about your eternal salvation. There's nothing more important that you could look at, that you could study, that you could search out to be. It's, it's true. And, and I just have to honestly say that if you're deceived, it's your own fault. It's, it's really your own fault. You've been warned. You've been told. Uh, you're hearing these things. Again, you don't have to accept them because I said it, but it should be enough to tweak you to go, hey, is there any truth to this? Is there any reality to this? Let me go study these things for myself. Let me go read the word of God for myself. That is the biggest thing. That is the biggest thing that I can tell you to do. Read the word of God and see how it goes. Now, if the reading of the word of God is contradicting tradition, which you will find that it does, well, where's your faith and trust? Is it in man? Now remember, tradition came through the church. If you look at all of these other things that have gone on through the church and the similarities and how you come, then you've got to start saying, well, am I doing the right thing by believing man? Or do I go to the word of God? The truth is there. And let me just close with this. If you are honestly and sincerely willing to look for the truth, then you will find it. God says, if you search for me and search for me with all of your heart, you will find me. If you are willing to believe the truth and you are willing to look for it, you will find it. Let me give you two verses from, the, from Scripture. John 8, 31. Then said the Jews, then said Jesus to the Jews who believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That's John 8. Uh, then said Jesus to the Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Listen. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If you truly know Jesus Christ, believe on him. It says, continue in my word. If you continue in your study, your reading and studying of the word of God, God says, I will bring you to truth. And the truth will set you free. It will set you free from every false belief that you've had. Every false thing that you've held on to. Acts 17, 11 says, and they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. <clears throat> That's the Bereans. They didn't accept anything just because somebody said it. It says they received the word with readiness of mind. They heard the preaching of the apostles. They heard the teaching of the apostles. But then they turned around and it said they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They picked up the word of God after the apostles talk to them. They picked up the word of God. And they said, let's open it up and let's see what the apostle Paul or the apostle Peter or any of the other apostles, let's see what, the, what we've heard what they've told us. Now let's look in the word of God and let's see if it's so. This was their authority. The word of God, the inspired word of God that God Almighty himself has given to us. God says, search this Search this sincerely and truly, and you will find the truth, and the truth will set you free. I trust that this series has been a blessing to you. I hope that it has. I hope that it's challenged you to continue on in your study. 
I hope it's challenged you that uh, to seek for the truth and to believe and to trust in the truth. I pray that it will be used in your life uh, for the glory of God. Thank you for watching, and may the Lord richly, richly bless you.